So we know we're not just designing interfaces, we're designing interactions. We're not just designing interactions, we're designing interventions. That's your job. However, what do we mean by design? What is design? This is one of those things like, there'll be 50,000 answers to this, uh, to this question, but I'm gonna give you one, but um, hopefully it's one that's helpful. So I'm going to say, first of all, that design is about achieving goals within constraints. Um, so there's some sort of goal or purpose that you're after. In inter interaction design, that might be about an enjoyment goal for people, about giving, you know, having somebody in to be able to sort of see a film or to be able to listen to music or to be able to engage in a social relationship. It might be a work goal, like achieving something efficiently, being able to produce videos easily. Um, but there's a goal there. And this is true probably of, of design in general. Even if you're designing pure art, you, you have some sort of goal, which might be, again, it might be aesthetic, or it might be about um, helping people understand meaning. There is a purpose that you have there, and it's about trying to achieve that purpose. However, there are constraints to that. You do not usually have total freedom. Otherwise, you become a magician, not a designer. Um, those constraints are critical. So, so some of those design constraints might be about the kinds of medium that you have to work with. You know, if you're a painter, whether you're using oils or watercolours. But as an interaction designer, it's about your computers that you're using, what kind of device somebody's likely to have, um, what kind of platform they're on. Is it, a, is it going to run an Apple or an Android if it's for a phone or something else? You know, these are, these are sort of broad questions. And sometimes you might have choices on those, so that becomes part of your design remit is to make those choices other times they're given to you you know this is going to run in this organization and everybody has this kind of computer full stop um, there's also constraints about time and money what's a, what's available to you you do not usually design with unlimited money or time you make choices there so because there are constraints you have to make choices and trade-offs between some of your constraints, and but, but those constraints are usually given, so the trade-off you often have to make is between different goals and purposes. Which of multiple goals are you going to achieve? You know, if I'm designing some video editing software, I want to make it, obviously, as pleasurable and enjoyable to use by the person who's doing the editing as, as I can. I don't want them to have a horrible job. However, I also might want to produce the highest quality video as that is possible um, because that's going to improve the experience ultimately of the person like yourself watching this video. Um, you know, it could be that I have to trade these off. I have to have something that's going to use, take more effort and possibly not very interesting and enjoyable effort by the person doing the video editing in order to produce a better quality for you. There is a, a trade-off. I cannot usually achieve all of my goals within the constraints. Trade-offs are essential to design. Um, the second of those constraints, one of the core constraints you have is your materials. An art setting, that might be about the kind of paint you're using or whether you're using, you know, whether you're painting or whether you're doing sculpting. And clearly that makes a difference. If you're a sculptor and if you're using stone or wood, that is going to change the nature of what you produce. This is also true of physical design and it's also true of um, of interaction design. So in a physical sense, you know, I often, uh, I won't do it now, but I often lift up uh, chairs and things like this and say, ah, oh, look, you know, um, this chair is made of metal. You know, if you take the, the design of a chair that's made of metal, it'll often have thin legs. If you make that in wood, the legs will break. But similarly, if you take a wooden chair, that's a much more solid one, and I made it of metal, it'd probably be too heavy to move. The materials that you use change the fundamental nature of a design. That's true of physical design, but it's also true of digital design. You have to understand the nature of the materials you're using. So if, you're, if you design something um, that is initially designed, should we say, for a desktop computer and just take the same design and squash it into a phone, it won't work. If you take the, a design as designed for your phone and then try and put it without sufficient changes onto a voice interaction, it won't work. You have to understand your materials. So what are your materials? So I've already given you some of them, uh, the kind of platforms are on your computer is part of materials. You have to understand the nature of those, of what's 
possible. Now, that's some of that's obvious, like the screen size, the things I was talking about. But also, you know, what computation is possible? Say you're, you're the designer, you're not a builder yourself. Say the person who's actually constructing this. Oh, this, ha this has to work like this. Is that possible? You know, or are you making things so difficult that you will cause problems elsewhere? You know, what are the fundamental capacities of it? You, you cannot, for instance, ask that um, for a, an interactive video that you have instant millisecond timing between two places distance in the earth because the speed of light constrains you. There are constraints of capacities like that, but also storage capacity. How much how much video can you store on a computer? That's a limited amount depending on the kind of device and um, the kind of tools you've got to use, the kind of platforms you're on. All of these are part of the material that's available to you as a designer. Now you might be that some of the details of that are done by other people but you have to design something that works within those constraints. You have to understand the material, the digital material. But of course, you also have to understand people. You know, so the other aspect of it is the people, the other cru crucial aspect. So you have to understand the nature of people, otherwise you can't design for them. People are part of your materials. Um, you have to understand their psychology, their social, social nature. Um, and of course, these extra things which are complicated about the interaction between the people and the technology and between people and each other. So, so you have a rich picture of materials. Now, you might be starting to think, and um, as I say materials, and then I put people into that picture, you might have felt comfortable me saying that your computer is your material. Of course, that's your material. But people as your material, surely that's a little bit functional way to think about people. Well, I mean, it is. You know, people are not a material in the same sense as uh, the paint you choose uh, when you're when you're painting, or whether you choose to use stone or wood when you're carving. It's not the same. People people have individuality and thing. However, what I'm going to say is, if you only treat people as well as you treat materials, you probably treat them better than they are often treated in design. So you treat people at least as good as materials. And I'll explain why. Um, how many times have you heard uh, an act, there's been a big accident, whether it's a plane accident, a train accident, something like that, and people say, oh, it was human error, right? It was due to human error. The person didn't do the right thing at the right point. They didn't notice something that was important and things went wrong. You know, you might have said it might be in a, a hospital situation, an industrial situation. So just imagine instead the wing falls off the plane because there's metal fatigue where the wing joined the plane. Now, you would say it was due to the metal fatigue, but you wouldn't say, oh, that was metal error. You would say it's a design error because the designer of the plane, the engineers, the detailed designers would have had to, should have understood the nature of metal. And the fact that you do get metal fatigue after a while, you should either design it so that the um, where there's metal fatigue, it doesn't, fundamentally mean the plane will crash, or you design it so that you can detect when that metal fatigue is happening and then take preventive maintenance. There are a number of strategies you've got because you understand that metal as a material has known ways of failing. We as humans have limits and constraints and ways that we fail in the sense we don't always do things in the perfect way, just like a piece of metal doesn't. As a designer, your job is to understand those limitations of people as actors in the system and ensure the design of the system as a whole works even when those happen. So whenever you hear about human error, it was human error, but typically it wasn't the operator or the pilot or the, the nurse or the doctor in the hospital. It was typically the designer of the system that's there. If you treat users as well as a piece of metal, you probably are dealing with them a lot better than they usually are dealt with. Um, so having said that, let's just roll back again and come back to what's the central message here. The central message is that for you as a designer, the user is at the heart of what you do. Understanding your users and you, know, you have to understand the technology they work with, but understand those users, understand the nature of them. And I said, then you'll start to treat them uh, far better, hopefully, 
and a piece of metal.